Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, the microphones, the subscriptions, the recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're really happy you're here. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to subscribe or follow Beekeeping Today podcast and give us a five-star rating. It really does help. Also, we are now adding complete transcripts of each episode on the website after the show notes. Check them out. You can also leave questions and comments online under each show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, reply to a question, ours or our listeners. Click on leave a comment at the top of the episode's show notes to join the discussion. Have you listened to an episode and thought, that person sounds really interesting? and I'd like to know more about them. Well, now you can. Each episode links to a guest profile. Each profile has a guest photo, bio, contact information, including Instagram and Twitter details if they have them. Check it out. And finally, share the podcast with your beekeeping friends, email them links, or mention it at your next beekeeper meeting. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. We have an episode lined up for you I know you will enjoy. Today, we welcome back Dr. Samuel Ramsey. If you're new to beekeeping and have never heard of Dr. Ramsey, let me provide a quick introduction. Sammy completed his Ph.D. in 2018 at Dr. Dennis Van Ingeldorf's lab at the University of Maryland, followed by postdoctoral training at the USDA ARSB lab in Beltsville, Maryland. It was during this time that his research on Varroa changed our understanding of just how these parasites actually fed on the honeybee. You see, up until this point, everyone believed the varroa fed on the hemolymph, or the blood, of the honeybee. Sammy's research determined that varroa were actually feeding on the fat bodies of the honeybee and the honeybee larvae. Now, if you're new to beekeeping, you're probably saying, well, duh, everybody knows this. Well, now they do, but not before then, and it is thanks to the work and research led by Sammy. I encourage you to check out our other talks with Dr. Ramsey, perhaps beginning with our November 6, 2018 interview, specifically about his research on the varroa and the honeybee's fat body. This is really required listening and knowledge for today's beekeeper, no matter where you live around the world. Varroa and the many diseases they vector are a serious threat to your bees and those of your neighbors. No matter how you classify yourself as a beekeeper today, commercial, sideliner, hobbyist, natural, alternative, whatever, you must have an active row management plan. There is just no getting around this fact. One last thing. When Jim and I were talking with Sammy after we stopped recording, we discussed his 2022 National Geographic Wayfinder Award and presentation. In the presentation, he discusses the challenges he faced getting into and staying in the University of Maryland's Entomology Ph.D. program. This is a very enlightening and uplifting story of perseverance and staying true to one's beliefs and knowing just what is right. No matter what challenge you're facing, the positive message in Sammy's story is encouraging. You can find a link to the presentation in the show notes or on the Beekeeping Today podcast website. Now, on to today's talk with Dr. Samuel Ramsey, but first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hey, beekeepers! Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. 
As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, the regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Beekeeping Today podcast. Got a little changes for you this week. Sitting in as the co-host spot is Dr. James Tu from Honey Bee Obscure podcast. Hey, Jim, welcome to the show. Well, as usual, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Really happy to have you here. And sitting across the virtual Beekeeping Today podcast interview table is our great friend of the podcast, Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Sammy, welcome back to the podcast. I am always glad to be back. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, this is probably the fourth or sixth time, depending on how you want to count it, that you've been on the <laughs> fourth show. Fourth or sixth. <laughs> well, you know, you got to count the archive specials that we have out there. Oh, yeah. I think you have to count the archives. You can't remove those from the calculations. <laughs> no, so it's your sixth time to the show, unless I've missed one. So we'll go with six. But you've had a lot of changes under your feet since we've last had you on. So let's talk about where are you sitting today? For sure. I am in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, uh, yes. And specifically because um, I am no longer a postdoc at the United States Department of Agriculture's Bee Research Laboratory, though I miss them very much. They were awesome. I am now the endowed professor of entomology at the University of Colorado Boulder, specifically the BioFrontiers Institute and the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. It's great to see that you're in Boulder. As we were talking before we started recording, that's my old stomping grounds, Boulder and north of Boulder. How are you finding Boulder, Colorado? I'm loving it here. The biggest drawback is that my family and friends are all off on the East Coast, so I don't actually know pretty much anyone around here, and I'm still getting getting connected and meeting people, but that experience has been wonderful. The people here have been very kind. The mountains, I had no idea that there was truly a such thing as the mountain air, yeah. <laughs> but there is a very distinct difference in taking a breath of mountain air, the way that it just clears your brain and it just smells amazing. There are so many places to exercise here. I've gotten into biking. It's just been an amazing experience. It is a wonderful, wonderful area. I'm very happy you're there and gives me yet another reason to get back to Colorado and I'll stop in to visit with you. To me, it sounds just like Northeast Ohio. I mean, it's, <laughs> except, except for the mountain thing, you know, we, we have air and that kind of thing here. Yeah, it works yeah. out well. Yeah, it works I, I've out. heard most locations these days do have air now. <laughs> <laughs> so I also know that you just got back or recently got back before you went to Boulder from Thailand. And that was your first trip post-COVID, I guess. So let's get caught up on Thailand and tropolay laps and everything else that you've been working in. For sure. So. Jumping right into that, <laughs> yeah. I know that we can think of it as the first trip post-COVID, but it certainly didn't feel that way. Several COVID restrictions were still in place. I went there in early January, and the annoying part there was that the day after Christmas, I got COVID, so that was exciting. I guess I already had it, but that's when I finally got a test that confirmed it. My whole family— In Thailand, you got COVID. No, no, no. no. This is right before I was supposed to go, so I had to postpone my trip. Because if you test positive for COVID in Thailand during the restrictions they had in place, you would be confined to either a hotel room or a single hospital room until you finally tested negative. And that can take sometimes up to two months. So I decided, all right, I'm just going to have to wait this out. I got to test a couple of times a week, every week until the closer to the end of January, where I was finally able to go. And I knew I had to make this work. I mean, this project has been in the making for so much time. I mean, years, raising money for this project, working with different people, establishing collaborations, purchasing the honeybee colony, setting up the project. I was not going to miss out on this. 
Well, I finally got there in collaboration with Project APSM, the Ramsey Research Foundation, and the wonderful support of viewers like you. <laughs> and as a result of that, I was able to get there and purchase the 60 colonies that we needed in order to get this work going. We added another treatment group to the study. Originally, I was testing different means of treating the, the tropolalaps mite, tropolalaps mercedesi, that I've been calling the tropy mite. And this parasite of honeybees, which grows more quickly than varroa, has population sizes that expand more rapidly and leads to the, the death of the colony much more quickly. I was very concerned about this organism and wanted to see what we could do about the fact that there are no treatments currently registered for usage against this parasite anywhere in the world. A company contacted us that had these low energy heaters that were actually wound into the, the wax foundation of the, the frames. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to test these. That would be amazing. Instead of using all the energy that it takes to heat the entire colony to try to kill mites that are inside of these cells and riding on the adult bees, they just targeted the ones that are reproducing below the cell capping, delivering a burst of heat to each of those individual brood cells. That is a low enough energy treatment method that it could be hooked up to solar panels. And the allure of something like that that could be carbon neutral was really exciting to me. In addition to that, we tested the normal commercially available heaters that heat the entire colony to 160 degrees. That encompasses the brood and the adult bees, and so a larger spread of the potential treatment itself. And then usage of formic acid, which I specifically chose out of all the other chemicals available because it can penetrate the cell capping. And in order to really get at these tropy mites, you got to get under the cell capping. That is where the vast majority of the population is. So we got all of those treatments together, two different ways of applying formic acid, the, the Thai method and the more westernized, standardized method that, that we have here, those heat treatment options, and applied them to these parasites. And the data is still being analyzed. There was quite a bit of data from this work, but the top line, some of the top line conclusions are already have already surfaced, uh, and it's just been really exciting to see this data, uh, see these data, and actually talk to different people about what some of the implications are for it. Because now we know that there are some things that can really fight this mite. One of them being formic acid. Formic acid in both formulations was the most effective measure to use against those parasites. We also saw some really pronounced effects of heating the colony with the commercial heaters that heated the entire colony itself. They were the least consistent of all the methods that we tried, in some colonies we would get close to 100% kill, in other colonies we would get 40 or 30 or 20%. And we've been trying to figure out how to establish a much greater level of consistency with that option because it could be very effective if it could be more consistent. And unfortunately, we had a very difficult time actually testing the solar powered heaters because the bees were so slow to actually build out wax on these frames. We had to wait for them to finally build out enough wax to rear brood inside of those frames and then wait for the parasites to infest that brood. And it just, it took quite a while. And so we ended up starting that particular trial with several of those colonies below the number of parasites that the other colonies had, but still enough for us to see some effect. It wasn't as pronounced as we were hoping. And we're looking forward to seeing if, if it's possible to raise the temperature that this particular method was using because it was one degree cooler than the other heater. And there's possibility that at higher temperatures, it may actually be more effective, but we're not sure. And I'll be heading back in 2024 to run some more tests on these parasites. So I will be going back in 2023 to conduct some collecting work, collecting tropy mites for genetic data and continuing work with the USDA in partnership with them. But the next time I'll actually be conducting field experiments will be about 14-ish months from now. I don't want to waste podcast time, Sam, but can you give me those temperatures again for both the specialized frames and for the full hive content? So about 41 degrees Celsius is the temperature. So 106 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature that the colonies were heated to. And the, the frames themselves that have that heating coil woven into them, those were only heated to about 40 degrees Celsius. And so that, that one degree difference, I think, could actually be 
potentially the reason why we saw less efficacy in, in that particular treatment. How do the bees react to that 106-degree temperature? <laughs> that is a great question, Jim. So the bees were not pleased. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'll tell you that, um, actually, the, the treatment that the bees responded to the best was actually Formic Pro. The bees just didn't seem to be that freaked out by the usage of Formic Pro, at least in the immediate application of it. After uh, several days of it being in the colony, we actually saw some die off of brood, some die off of some of the adult bee population, likely as a result of the pretty ridiculous amount of humidity and heat that you have in Thailand that can make this can make formic acid a lot more bioactive. But when you heat the colony, you'll notice that there is a mass exodus of a huge clump of bees that all ball up on the front of the colony. And at the center of that mass, I've hypothesized, is the queen. We found her at the center of the mass of two of these, but we haven't gone through every single colony to, to look and see where the queen is. And I think that the reason for that is because sperm viability can be adversely affected by the temperature of the colony itself. She's done this multiple mating and stored the sperm of multiple males and her spermatheca. And if that is heated in such a way that the, the sperm start to die or become less mobile, unfortunately, that can affect her capacity to be an effective queen going forward. And so they leave, and then they go back in the colony when we remove the heating pad, and it's the brood that can't leave. And that is our primary focus because, I mean, close to 100% of the population of trophy mites at any point is in the brood. So let's take this quick opportunity to hear from our friends at Better Bee. And when we come back, Sammy, I would like you just to give us a quick recap of what a tropic laylapse mite is for those who don't know. Hey, podcast listeners, here's what we've been waiting for all year long. It's time to harvest and extract the honey. When you're ready to bottle and sell your crop, head over to betterbee.com. There you can shop for custom honey labels and glass or plastic honey containers. As your partners in Better Beekeeping, Better Bee does all the work of figuring out the weight each honey container will hold, not just the standard water weight or volume measure. So you can choose from the classics or go bold and different with a great selection of uniquely designed bottles. Check out our 50-plus container options and order with confidence at BetterBee.com. Hi, right, welcome back, Dr. Ramsey, Sammy. What is a tropolelapse mite? <laughs> <laughs> They're small. These tropy mites. I tell you, like, I, I wish more people knew what they were because I get very nervous about their capacity to show up here and go unnoticed. They're a small mite, about a third the width of a varroa mite. So your typical varroa mite is about 1.6 millimeters, sort of the size of a sesame seed, maybe a strawberry seed. And it's these mites that are about a third that width. And they are a lot faster than Varroa because they're not dragging around this giant turtle shell around them that, that the Varroa mites seem to have. That shield over their body has been greatly reduced, and uh, it allows them to have much more locomotory prowess. They're just darting around the frames of the colony. Really, really quick parasites. But the thing that makes them so concerning is that their population size grows much more rapidly than Varroa. They seem to grow a little bit faster in development than Varroa, but the big reason for their ability to overtake the colony is that they don't spend that period of time on the adult bees that you see in Varroa. So Varroa rotate between two segments of their life cycle. One we call the reproductive phase, where they are under the cell capping, feeding on the brood, producing eggs at a rate of one every 30 hours. And then after they're done reproducing, they climb onto the body of adult bees, onto nurse bees. And this was the phase that we used to call the phoretic phase. The research that I conducted as a graduate student that I was continuing con to conduct as a postdoc has shown that that's not a phoretic phase. They feed on the adult bees, so they are parasitic on the adult bees and the brood. And a phoretic phase is specifically defined as an organism that does not feed on another creature and only uses them as a source of transit from one location to the next. Well, the trophy mites, probably because of their own locomotory capacity, they spend very little time on the adult bees. 
We don't know exactly why they're able to avoid the the nutrition that we would expect that they would need in that part of the process. Varroa feed on the adult bees, and they need that nutrition in order to go back into their reproductive cycle. Tropy mites don't. They just jump right back into their reproductive cycle, which, because Varroa are on adult bees between 3 and 13 days, with an average of 7 days, about a week on these adult bees, that means that there's a whole week to two weeks that their reproductive cycle is suspended. And the tropy mites just jump right back into reproduction. It allows their population sizes to grow two to three times faster than Varroa on average, and that is really concerning. What are the mellifera keepers there doing? <laughs> ah, I love your questions, Jim. This is great. They really help with telling this story because a big part of why I wanted to do this work in Thailand is because I've invested so much time in learning Thai culture and learning the language. And that's allowed me an in with a lot of Thai beekeepers where I can talk to them and connect with them and they'll share things with me. And so something that some Thai beekeepers have shared with me in the past is that under most circumstances, there's not a lot that they can do to kill the mites directly. And so their primary means of controlling the population size is keeping the entire colony from having too much brood. You will never see these hive boxes stacked on top of each other as is typical here in the US. A single box will suffice. You basically load it up where only half of the box is taken up. The bees build out to the other side of the box, uh, rearing a substantial amount of brood. And when they fill the whole box, you take all that brood out and you let them start over. A colony that is full of brood is a colony that is going to die because the tropy mites will overrun that colony so rapidly. They need that brood to reproduce. But that doesn't allow your colony to get strong, to really have contract strength. And if you're trying to make honey or you're trying to, to really pollinate need a bunch of plants, there's not a lot that you can do with that small colony. So beekeepers there, when they want to make sure that they're able to get honey and when they want to pollinate the longan and lychee trees, they will treat these colonies. They know that formic acid has been effective against Varroa in the past. And a really exciting thing is that formic acid is used constantly in Thailand in the rubber plantations that are spread throughout the country. Industrial strength formic acid, which is 85 to 90 percent formic acid, is used on those farms to solidify the liquid rubber that comes out of those trees into the more solid substance that is utilized in tires and bubble gum and stuff. So anyway, yeah, there's rubber in your gum. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so... So taking that super concentrated formic acid, they soak these chunks of wood, like basically paint stirrers. They soak them in formic acid and then slide them into the front of the colony. And that formic acid then aerosolizes in the colony. It gets to a high enough concentration where it can penetrate the cell capping, and then it kills the parasites under the cell capping. So that's a, a very low cost way of treating these parasites. And I think it's very industrious and was really proud to see that kind of ingenuity. And it's effective against the Varroa at the same time. Exactly. Oh, it kicked both of the mites butts. I would expect that it would even be effective against the Uvaroa mite, which I'm also working on studying now and got to encounter for the very first time in real life in January of last year. Have you guys even heard of those? Uvaroa? My Varroa? Your Varroa. Uvaroa? <laughs> E-U-V-A-R-R-O-A. Uvaroa. All right. All right. No, no, not familiar with that at all. Oh, these things are wackadoodle. So they're like Varroa, but hippies. So, you know, back in the day, they used to yell, cut your hair, you hippies. <laughs> uh, if you see a, a hippie style you Varroa mite, you'll notice very rapidly that the hairs on the back end of its body, which are normally very short in Varroa, are really long. Like they just let themselves go. Um, in, in, <laughs> in most other ways, they look pretty much just like Varroa mites. They're a little bit smaller and they're much rounder. So they're kind of circular instead of ovals. And they have those long hairs. But what makes them really interesting is that they live a lot longer than Varroa. You can expect a Varroa mite to live like 42 to 60 days. You can expect a U Varroa mite to live for a year and a half. 
Is this in Thailand or is this? This is in Thailand. They better not be in the States. That would be a problem. But APHIS is working hard to make sure, so the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service is working really hard to make sure that these kinds of things don't just show up without us not knowing it. And I actually have a partnership with them to help in those efforts. So I'm collecting these parasites so that we can genetically analyze them, get their genome sequenced, and And all of that for the goal of making sure that if they are to arrive, or even if we're just anticipating that they could make their way here, we can test hive debris and look for their genetic information. And did I say debris? We can test hive (laughs) debris and look for their genetic information. (laughs) We're going with you. I got a lot of debris right here in my shop. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, we, we really need to work on how we choose to spell words in English. Yeah, we do. We really do. Back to the Rocky Mountain High that you're talking about, the uh, <laughs> the, the altitude. Blame it yeah, on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, these Uvaroa mites are parasites of the dwarf honeybees. So we know that there are three subgenera of honeybees. The ones that we know of are the cavity nesting bees. They're always hiding in like a tree hole or something, and that's how they do their thing. And that's the adaptation that's allowed them to spread all over the world because you can control the temperature and humidity inside of a cavity. But if you just build out a big comb on the side of a tree, it's very difficult for you to climate control that that place. So you've got to stick around an area that's really warm all year long, hence why the rest of the bees are confined primarily to the tropics. So there are the cavity nesting bees, the giant honeybees, and the dwarf honeybees, tiny little bees that make their honeycomb wrapped around a branch. So the part around the branch is the honey, and then the part hanging from the branch is where all the brood is, and then the pollen's just like sort of in between. And it's a really cool colony structure. The Uvaroa mites can be fairly highly prevalent in some of these colonies after they've gotten older. Unfortunately, it's been shown that the Uvaroa mites are capable of not just reproducing on Apis mellifera, but they produce more than twice as many offspring if they are on Apis mellifera than the dwarf honeybees. And so it is my expectation that the Uvaroa being in such close contact with Apis mellifera now will make that host switch and that would allow them to then spread much farther than they are. So got to keep an eye on all of these parasites and can't take our eye off the ball. Well, I'm overwhelmed. (laughs) I'm still trying to control Varroa. Yeah. (laughs) And that's like using an LED watch. I mean, this is so, so yesterday kind of thing. Well, Jim, I'm glad that you are working on trying to control Varroa because there are some people who have just given up on these things. They are annoying. They can be very difficult to get a handle on, especially at particular times of year. But it is really important that we don't just allow our bees to like basically be mangy cattle roaming fields. And I'm working on that too, by the way. So I, I'm not just conducting research overseas, though I have to say thank you to the BioFrontiers Institute and eBio here at, at CU Boulder because they are helping me establish a research station in Thailand so that I can conduct this research on trophy mites there. But when I'm here in the U.S. at my super cool lab here, we're actually working on doing everything that we can to kick the Varroa mites' butt. So right now, I've just submitted a paper where I am focusing my attention on the discovery that I made as a graduate student and how to utilize our understanding that the varroa mite isn't feeding on the bee's blood, it's feeding on the fat body. How can we use that discovery to kill those parasites? And the paper that I just submitted with a very strange name, it's called Kleptocytosis. This paper is about a weird pathway in varroa that we are currently charting here at the lab and figuring out how to disrupt it. The varroa mites have this weird, weird, weird ability. They are a parasite. They're feeding on a host and they have a very specific schedule that they absolutely have to stick to. If the cell, if they are too slow in reproducing and the larva transitions into a pupa and the pupa turns into an adult and chews its way out before their babies reach adulthood, that's the end for all of them. That 
parasite has wasted its time and all of its resources and all of its babies are going to die. So they have to be able to accelerate the reproductive processes to keep up with just that what little over a week amount of time that they have to get a baby all the way to adulthood. Well, how do you do that? And how do you produce an egg that is absolutely gigantic? I mean, it is close to or more than 30% of that mite's body volume is in a single egg that they produce every 24 hours or every 30 hours. So if you're going to produce an egg that huge pretty much every day, you got to have some weird way of doing this because there just doesn't seem to be enough nutrition in the world for you to make that happen. Well, instead of them going through normal digestive processes, I mean, every creature eats stuff and then breaks it down and then uses those molecules to build what it needs, but they've decided to do something much more clever. They attach themselves to the host, they feed on the fat body tissue, and what's inside of fat body tissue? A ton of vitiligenin. Uh, vitiligenin is an egg yolk protein. It's the precursors that the queen bees use to uh, actually create the egg yolk inside of their eggs. And that is the largest biochemical input, the hugest resource and amount of energy that's put into these eggs is in building that incredibly nutritive egg yolk that the embryo will use as a source of energy and a source of amino acids to structure its own body. If you don't put enough egg yolk into an egg, you don't get an embryo that develops. You just have a, a, an inviable egg. Well, instead of the mites making tons of egg yolk themselves, they siphon the egg yolk proteins from their honeybee host and load it into their own eggs in a process that I've been referring to as kleptocytosis, which would literally in Greek be provisioning a cell with something stolen. And so this kleptocytotic process is really fascinating because we know that the mites are capable of producing egg yolk proteins, but when we looked at their egg specifically, one of the two egg yolk proteins that they create is totally missing from their eggs. It doesn't even go in there. They're using it for something else entirely. We don't even know what they are doing with it, but they've decided to replace it instead with what they've stolen from these bees. And so if we can find a way to disrupt their capacity to get these proteins from the bees into their eggs, we can stop them from making viable eggs, or at the very least, slow the development of their offspring so that they miss their schedule. And that's what I'm working on now. Well, so far, so good, right? Yeah, so far, so good. I'm very excited. So you expect to have a product out, what, next summer? <laughs> you know... I wish that things worked <laughs> that rapidly, but it is unfortunate. The minimum for these kinds of things is typically 10 years, and we're still in R&D for this sort of thing. But just to let you know, I know that everybody is... Everybody who's trying to control Varroa is really annoyed by these parasites, and it feels like you're just on a treadmill, and you have to run as fast as possible just to remain in place. I understand that, and I believe that we can do something about that, but in the interim... Please maintain patience. Please keep running as best you can because we can't allow these parasites to overtake the bees and to diminish the welfare of one of the most important organisms on our planet. Well, I agree. I'm sold completely. <laughs> and I'm on that treadmill you're talking about. Yeah, me too. And I'm also an old guy and I knew bees before Varroa. So it's always so frustrating to have this distant memory now of what it was like to keep bees and not even be able to spell Varroa. You're a lucky man, Jim, because I do not have any memory of that. I cannot say that I'm lucky. It's a very, <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's a useless memory. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm no, no. <laughs> it's a memory that one day you may be able to get back to and see as a reality. Yeah, I would again. love that. I would love that. Unfortunately for me, I have no memory of that. Beekeeping has always been struggle for me and for my generation. We've all been running on that treadmill. I was negative two when Varroa arrived. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't feel old until just about now. <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling fine just about two seconds ago. Well, this is really exciting. The whole idea of disrupting that cycle of developing the Varroa egg yolk, for lack of a better term, would be wild if that could actually bear fruit. Yeah. Oh, it certainly would be. I don't even know where to start. Would something like that be a gene approach? We're figuring that out now. So right now, the best idea that we have available to us is to throw everything at the wall and see <laughs> what sticks. So a chemical approach, a genetic approach, just looking at different ways of disrupting the actual pathway. And 
after we have confirmed that disruption of the pathway officially does result in these inviable eggs, then we can figure out how to best tailor it such that it's something that, that is economically viable and won't break the bank. <laughs> Sam, you keep saying we. Do you have graduate students and postdocs and whatever? The Ramsey Lab, it is remarkable to me that I just got here and I had multiple students coming. I've got like eight different students who have asked about potentially being in my lab. I've already got two postdocs, one in Thailand currently, one here in Boulder, who are working with me on the different projects that we're conducting here. It's been incredible. I'm also partnering with different labs here at BioFrontiers. The genetics lab is helping to look at the genetics of the varroa mite, the tropi mite, and the uvaroa mite. One of the biochemistry labs here at BioFrontiers uh, is working with uh, helping me on this project for all the biochemical elements of it that are not within my wheelhouse. They have been marvelously helpful, producing all kinds of great ideas. And then microscopy core has been incredible. We've got some remarkable images that you're going to be seeing soon of these fluorescent tags that we've been able to attach to the molecule to see how well we can disrupt it. That's a team now. That's a mm -hmm. team. <laughs> well, of course, none of that will work against, I assume, the tropa laps. So this is a single solution <sighs> approach. We don't know that. But I'm a little bit concerned that that may well be the case. And that's based on one observation that I've noted for some time now. Varroa needs to feed on the adult bees. And this work on the kleptocytosis pathway has shown why Varroa needs to feed on the adult bees. There are different sets of proteins, egg yolk precursors, in the fat body of adult bees than in the fat body of the brood. And so they need both sets of egg yolk precursors to make the egg yolk for their eggs. So they have to siphon enough of it from the adult bees and store it away and then climb into the cells and get enough of what they need from the juveniles in order to actually make these, these eggs. And the tropi mites aren't going after the adult bees. So either they're only working with the egg yolk precursors that are present in the brood, or they're making their own, and we're going to have to find an entirely different method of disrupting those parasites. But ingenuity I think that I've got enough of it that we can figure this out that one, uh, that round of parasites as well. <laughs> well, I encourage anybody who's out there listening to the podcast of this episode, if you don't know anything about triple A mites, make sure you go out and check on numerous videos on YouTube. You'll start itching immediately. <laughs> <laughs> you see them run around, they run 100 miles an hour, it seems. Yeah, and so quick. And I can just imagine them just being all over the body. It just like makes me itch just thinking about it. This is always the fastest time on any episode is talking with you, Sammy, and it's really enjoyable. But before we let you go, because we're coming up on our time, you were doing some work with formerly known as the Asian Giant Hornet in Thailand. Can you give us any kind of latest updates? I know they haven't found any in Washington State and Canada yet this year. Fingers crossed. <laughs> but still, the research is important. Since I became an entomologist, and even before I was officially classed as one, some of my favorite parts of working in entomology have really been the detective work. Knowing and understanding the biology of an organism and using that understanding of it to make the sorts of inferences that can tell you how it got there, what it's doing, why it's here, and how to get rid of it. I did that kind of work working for a pest management company called American Pest in Maryland, and that was the first time that I really got paid to do this kind of stuff and draw these sorts of conclusions. And it was amazing. Well, now the USDA, have, uh, USDA APHIS, has specifically asked me to do that sort of thing. We're working hard on better understanding how the different hornets that have arrived in the U.S. actually got here. We have noticed that there's a fair amount of genetic diversity in these hornets to the extent that it's not possible that it was just one introduction of a hornet. It seems like multiple introductions of multiple different individuals, and we have seen hornets from other species introduced around the same time all of which from Asia. And so we have to understand how they're getting here. And one of the most important elements of understanding that is knowing where they came from. And then we can start answering the why. And so I'm collecting hornets, that postdoc that uh, I told you about who is currently in Thailand, um, Sanjay Nari. He is doing a wonderful job of helping get the collection process started before I even arrive. 
We've already collected some in my time in Thailand this year from January to March, April, uh, April. It's an ongoing process that will probably continue for a few more years as we collect samples from all the different areas of Asia and begin to better understand the genetic landscape of the different populations. You're setting the seeds for a great conspiracy novel on bioterrorism. (laughs) (laughs) That would be the most dramatic of all the possible conclusions, that they were sent here intentionally to terrorize us. Oh, you never know. Uh, Well, there's also the possibility that they were sent here intentionally not to terrorize us, but intentionally to be a source of protein. So they actually produce this goo called uh, Vespa amino acid mixture because the adult bees aren't capable of feeding on solid food. They can't eat meat, but still need a lot of protein. So they feed huge chunks of meat to their babies. Their babies chew it all up and then regurgitate this blob of really, really, really dense protein for the adult bees. And it's actually one of the most efficient sets of proteins that we as human beings can consume and use to build muscle. It allows for the much more effective movement of muscles inside of the body. And so there are some people who use them as a supplement. There are some athletes who have been using them. And it's possible that maybe somebody wanted to start a business here and sent some hornets over so that they can seed an industry that we don't currently have. Where is such an industry? So those industries thrive in Asia, in Japan, in Korea, in different parts of Asia. There are individuals who are actually raising these hornets intentionally and collecting this Vespa amino acid mixture so that it can be sold commercially. And it is being sold commercially. I had no idea. Sammy, I'm eyeing your bike behind you, and you may remember <laughs> I'm an I'm avid cyclist, and we use the gel packets and energy for long-distance cycling endurance stuff. And I can, I can see, you know, just reaching in your back jersey pocket and grabbing a couple grubs and squirting them into your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> see, it's the grub part that I think people would freak out about. But when you can separate people from where different foods come from, as long as they don't have to see how the sausage is made, I can very easily <laughs> see some very clever marketing for, like— you know, wasp goo. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm just thinking instead of an aluminum foil wrapper along the side of the road, you just cast away the skin <laughs> and, and it's, it biodegrades. It's true. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to work on this. <laughs> you know what? You really should. You really should. Make sure you get some slick marketing going. There's like monster energy drinks. Now you need Vespa energy Hey, I've got drinks. my eye on you biking people. <laughs> now, I think you biking people have alternative agendas here. (laughs) You might not be wrong about that, Jim. Yeah. (laughs) Go faster, farther, longer. All right, Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Sammy, really, really enjoy having you on the podcast. Look forward to having you back and bringing us up to date on everything Triple A laps, Varroa, Asian Giant Hornet, anything else that you come across. It seems that I am officially a friend of the show now. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys... (laughs) Call me anytime. I love getting the opportunity to talk to you guys and to the entire audience that you've amassed here. We enjoy having you on. Well, Doctor, I personally enjoyed it, too, and I'm, I'm a much better person for having sat through your lecture. Thank you for helping me, sir. Thanks, Jim. But because of you, it wasn't a lecture. It was a great conversation. Oh, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I learned a lot. Jim, I'm glad you had an opportunity to be on the the episode with Dr. Ramsey and with Sammy. It is just so much fun having him on the show. Always so entertaining and always so informative. My brain hurts, Jeff. (laughs) I was trying to assimilate and absorb, and he's so energetic, dynamic. I just had to run to hope the entire time to keep up with him. Yeah, I don't even know where to start. I'm glad that he's looking into the AAA laps because after the one of the times he was on, I went out and looked at that on the internet. And as I said when we're talking to him, the YouTube videos of the AAA laps might are just frightening. Right. They really are. Seeing Varroa is one thing, but seeing the AAA laps run around it would just just be very saddening. Yeah, I admit it during the program, I'm overwhelmed because I'm still trying to control Varroa, do something with Varroa, learn to live with it, coexist, and now you hear that these other things are on the horizon. And I've got to say, not now, not now. I've got to I've got to get this thing under control with Varroa first before we take on something else. So I hope we have some time. Yeah. The saving grace is that the formic pro or the formic acid seems to uh, be effective on both. So maybe there's something there. All right. I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I am too. 
Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at globalpatties.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for their longtime support. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at betterbee.com. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their support of Bee Books Old New with Kim Flodham. Check out all of their books at northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to leave us comments and questions at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.